Tools of the Laboratory, the Methods for Studying Microorganisms. Okay, so microorganisms aren't the easiest things to study. We talked about in chapter one some reasons why they're difficult, some reasons why they are easy. Um, but some of the problems you run into with trying to study microbes is being able to separate species because microbes almost never exist alone. There are generally many microbes existing on the same, uh, um, growing on whatever it is you're collecting them from. Another problem that you run into with uh, trying to culture microbes is being able to grow them in artificial media. Now, some of them grow really easily, but there are some of them that are very, very difficult, and we'll talk about that later on in this chapter. Another issue is that these things are invisible with the naked eye, so you've got to be able to magnify them using different means, and we're going to discuss that in this chapter as well. Um, another one is keeping unwanted microbes from contamination. So when you are trying to culture one specific type of microbe, uh, you, you have to be able to separate them, but you also have to be able to keep the uh, sample that you're using from being contaminated because there are microbes literally everywhere, in the air, floating around, in the dust. Um, anything you touch will transfer microbes to your fingers, and so if you happen to accidentally um, touch your culture, then you're going to have contamination. So there this, there's this thing called the five eyes that uh, it's just basically some rules that, that you follow when you are working with um, microbes. So the first one is inoculation and we're going to learn what that is later but uh, essentially it is um, introducing the microbe or the strain of microorganism um, to the growth medium so that you can culture it. Uh, the next I is incubation and this is the actual growth of the microbe. Isolation, uh, this is t being able to separate one microorganism from another so that you can get only one type. Inspection, uh, this is looking at it looking at either under a microscope or uh, simply looking at the um, type of uh, growth patterns that it has, um, the color of the growth patterns, we call them colonies, um, those sorts of things. And then the last one is identification. So what this entails, it's actually somewhat complicated because there's generally a lot of steps involved with it but this is being able to identify what type of microorganism and use a, use different things um, including uh, just looking at it under a microscope uh, but there are a lot of other things such as uh, staining seeing what types of things it grows on what types of things it won't grow on and so on and so forth okay so this figure in your book just shows the um, five eyes so the first one here is showing specimen collection, and it's just showing different, showing different ways that you can get a specimen, such as swabbing someone's hand, or you could swab literally anything, um, bathroom, urinals, handles on doors, you name it. Um, blood, because if you have an infection, you'll be able to take blood and culture the um, microorganism from that. Um, urine samples, again, if you've got, for example, like a urinary tract infection, you'll be able to culture and determine whether or not a person is infected and what type of bacteria is infecting them. Um, inoculation, so again, this is introducing your bacteria um, to, or it could be a fungus or whatever, but introducing it to some sort of a growth medium. And so on the left there, it's showing uh, right here, this is a streak plate, so this is agar, or agar, depending on how you want to say it. And what they do is they inoculate it with this thing called a loop, 
and spread it on this, and we'll learn how to do that later on in the in this term. Um, and it spreads the uh, bacterium or bacteria, whatever the case may be, onto this growth medium, and then um, later on we're going to see right here we're going to incubate it. Okay, um, but there are certain types of bacteria that have very specific things that they have to live on, and so a a, a blood medium is an is another example of something. Um, some are even more difficult than that and you actually have to um, inject them into the embryo of some sort of a bird to get them to grow so um, you can take more time and read through this if you want to um, the next I was incubation and so this right here is an incubator and it sometimes these look like sort of like a fridge but they're not they're actually warm um, we'll talk about the temperature a little bit later um, but you'll put either this plate or right here it's showing test tubes uh, and they could have the same medium that's in this plate here um, inside of one of these incubators because they're dark and warm and that is generally the um, environment that you need to be able to grow bacteria. Um, number three, isolation. And so, as we said before, what we need to do is be able to isolate different bacteria, okay? And so, by basically diluting it to the point where you're only getting one bacterium um, dropped in a specific area will allow us to be able to grow several bacteria from that one. And we'll talk about how bacteria um, replicate themselves a little bit later in another chapter, but... Um, Suffice it to say, right now, what we want to do is, is dilute them out, and what that'll do is leave one colony with only one type of bacterium, and then we can um, take that one colony and introduce it into a new um, growth medium so that we know we've only got that one. Okay, inspection. Again, th this person's using a microscope, but there are lots of other ways to be able to do it. Um, be, uh, with that, excuse me. Looking at them under, under a microscope or looking at the cultures would pretty much be inspection. Identification was, was what I meant to say. There's a lot of different ways that we can identify them, one of which is using a microscope. Um, others, however, are using, like it says, biochemical tests, which we'll get to at the very end of the chapter, uh, excuse me, the term, um, immunologic tests, and you can actually do these right in, right in the doctor's office nowadays in some cases. Um, here showing them under a microscope because they have different sizes, different shapes, different morphology. Um, DNA analysis nowadays, I mean that's only been going on for about 30 years now um, to be able to analyze DNA. Um, but that's another thing that we can use to identify the different types of bacteria. As a matter of fact, we, until we had the ability to identify them based on DNA, um, some organisms were actually thought to be um, one species and now it's known that they are separate species. Okay, so if it's not obvious already, um, these tests, uh, excuse me, the five eyes make it possible to be able to study bacteria because of those th reasons that we talked about at the beginning. Um, so we've been able to develop, not we, I shouldn't take credit for any of this, but smarter people than I have been able to develop tests now um, to be able to identify um, types of viruses and bacteria and, and whatnot um, and make it much, much easier. And so, again, at the end of this class, we'll, we'll discuss some specifics when we start talking about um, identifying pathogens. So let's talk about some of these one by one. So inoculation. So there's this word called culture. Um, it's a funny word because it can mean the propagation of microorganisms. That's just a funny way of saying growing them. Um, but you can also um, use it as a, as a uh, noun, okay? Meaning each one of these little things here would be a culture. Okay, well, that's actually a colony, but this whole thing is a culture here. Um, so you culture a culture. So it's kind of strange. Anyway, so medium, you've heard me use that word medium, and that's singular, plural is media. Um, you use it the same way you use it, you know, if you're talking about arts and crafts supplies or something like that. It's just stuff, okay? So the medium is the stuff that we grow our cultures in. Inoculation 
is putting those cultures in the growth medium. So the word they use here is implantation, but you know, just introducing it to the growth medium. If you if you put a bacteria on something that it can live in and eat, then it will grow. And that's essentially all you're trying to provide here. Okay. Now it should be obvious if you haven't thought about it, but when you put uh, when you inoculate something, you need to make sure your instruments are sterile. We'll actually do that in the lab. We'll, uh, when we do our virtual lab, we'll talk about sterilization techniques. Um, you actually heat that loop up to where it's white hot, um, and that kills anything that might be living on it. And then you dip it into whatever um, sample you're using, and you streak it across a plate is an example. So things like loops, swabs, pipettes, needles, whatever, they just have to all be um, sterile. Okay, so clinical specimen can be uh, specimens can be blood, cerebrospinal fluid, which we just call CSF. That's the fluid around your brain and spinal cord, uh, spit, urine, feces, or diseased tissue. So if they take a if you've got some sort of a an open wound or something that's infected and isn't healing, for example, or you've got some sort of weird necrotic um, disease they may take a sample of that tissue and analyze it to determine what is um, infecting you. So the incubator, you may have heard that word when you're talking about, um, I grew up on a farm and my dad, he raised chickens and so he would go get the eggs. I don't know why, he would, he would just leave them under the chicken. I think sometimes because the chickens abandon them. But, um, or if it's too cold or whatever. But anyway, he'd get the eggs and he'd bring them up and put them in an incubator. And an incubator was just a um, machine that would simulate being under a chicken. Well, it's the same sort of thing with this. It's just um, for bacteria. And there are, there are very various types of incubators. Some actually move the specimen. Some just provide a warm, dark place. Um, but it's a temperature-controlled device that you put your um, that you put your specimens in okay so they usually keep them somewhere between 20 and 40 Celsius which is like 70 to uh, like 105 uh, Fahrenheit so warm basically um, atmospheric gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide may also be required and so in some incubators like I said they um, can be a little uh, more complicated, but they may may provide an area with just carbon dioxide or just o uh, oxygen or whatever the case may be. So the idea behind the incubation is to get them to grow as best as possible. And so um, depending on what bacterium you are trying to grow will sort of determine what temperature it is that you set it at and, and so on. Okay, so the incubation period is also different for different bacteria, just like you know, dogs and people and hummingbirds and whatever all grow at a different rate, you know, so do bacteria. So it may be from a day to several weeks to be able to get your culture. Okay, so we've been talking about um, isolation and contamination and so on and so forth. So there are some different words we can use to describe those situations. So what we're ultimately trying to get to generally is a pure culture um, which means that there's only one species growing in it if pure nothing else um, this is the most common one that we use in the lab because it obviously allows us to study um, one type of microbe and see how it reacts to different things and, and so on okay so over here on the right it shows uh, different test tubes with different things. So the white one on the left is E. coli. Um, the one in the middle is Micrococcus luteus, and the one on the far right is Serratia marcescens. And you can see that it, it at least appears that there's only one thing in them, and, and that's the case. Um, these are slant tubes. Um, a mixed culture isn't necessarily something we don't want. Um, but it's two or more identified, easily differentiated species of microorganisms. So if you look at the picture here, you can see that there's Micrococcus luteus mixed with what appears to be E. coli, um, and you can easily differentiate the two. So you've got these white colonies and then these yellow colonies that look different from each other. A 
contaminated culture is generally not something we are after okay so it's just what it sounds like you have a known um, bacterium that gets contaminated with something that's unknown okay um, all kinds of different ways you can contaminate things um, essentially it's just transferring some sort of a bacterium into your sample um, airborne is a common one um, but like I said before touching things unsterilized equipment um, and so on so over here on the right it shows the serratia marcescens which is um, actually um, it's an enterobacter actually lives in your intestines um, but it shows that it is um, has contaminated um, the petri dish over there on the right so media so as I said before medium is the singular version of media um, this is just the food for microbes and it's and it's not just the food it's also the environment sort of for them to live in um, they've got to have a place to be able to grow right um, so we'll put medium in different things test tubes flasks petri dishes and so on so some microbes will not grow in artificial medium matter of fact no viruses will they have to have a host cell because that's how they replicate um, and some bacterium will not bacteria will not so they need um, some sort of a host organism so some of the different types of media liquid media semi-solid media and a solid that can be converted to a liquid you can actually heat it up and reconvert it to a liquid but then there's also solids that can't be liquefied once they're solid they're solid so agar is by far the most common one that we are going to be using and, and most of the things that we'll talk about are grown on so it's a complex polysaccharide which you remember is a uh, sugar from the algae gelatium liquefies at 100 degrees Celsius which is boiling and solidifies at 42 which is pretty cool it's like 70 something degrees and what that allows us to do is to be able to liquefy it but if 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 it's solidified at say you know 99 degrees Celsius when we reintroduced our cultures back into it it would kill them okay so what we can do is we can actually cool it down to in the high 40s or something and be able to uh, introduce um, our bacteria or microbes into the agar without killing them and then it'll solidify and they can go ahead and grow um, and it also as it says here makes it so that the handler meaning you can grab a hold of them without burning yourself as well okay agar is flexible and moldable and it can hold moisture and nutrients which makes it really key for a lot of bacteria you know that um, just from your life experiences of seeing things get rotten they generally rot when they are warm and dark especially warm um, but they also have to be moist if they're if they dry out they don't grow um, that's why you can leave a piece of bread out on the countertop and let it dry out and it basically just gets hard but if you leave it in the bag on the countertop eventually it gets all moldy um, the agar itself is not a digestible nutrient so remember I told you that the medium isn't just food well this is an example so the agar you can have food mixed in it sugars and things like that um, but the agar itself is not digestible it's kind of like wood for example cellulose is a polysaccharide but it's not digestible either uh, at least not by most organisms okay so chemical content of media so there's this thing called chemically defined media and this is just a, a type of medium that we know exactly what's in it okay so it contains could be pure organic or inorganic compounds that um, essentially from one medium to another would be exactly the same so the molecular content is specified by some exact t 
type of formula so you can buy this type of media from you know a company who sells it and you know you're getting the same thing every single time minimal media is kind of what it sounds like doesn't have very much in it it's got minimal nutrients it might just have some salts or amino acids or you know maybe one type of sugar or something like that um, could be organic compounds could be organic organic compounds whatever but it, the long and short of it is it doesn't have very much stuff in it okay complex media contains at least one ingredient that is not chemically definable and, and the reason why it's not chemically definable well let me just give you examples here it could be extracts of animals like blood um, uh, that's actually not exactly right um, maybe more like um, purulent discharge or something like that would be a better example um, plants um, yeasts uh, it could be blood it could be serum which is the liquid part of the blood um, meat extracts infusions which is essentially you know just a ground up you know mixed up bunch of stuff that there's absolutely no possible way to chemically define it that's what they call a complex medium okay so in other words it's a rich mixture of nutrients for microbes that need that complex type of medium to grow on okay so in your book it shows some uh, this table 2.2 a and b um, it shows some different types of medium so on the top here it shows defined medium for growing staph aureus um, and this is just one type okay but you can see how specific it is so 0.25 grams of each one of these amino acids here 0.5 grams of each one of these amino acids here and 0.12 grams of each of these two amino acids here and then all of these additional um, ingredients in very 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 small amounts okay um, same bacterium staphylococcus aureus but this right here is a brain heart infusion which is basically brain and heart blended up um, into a broth um, and so it shows you what's in here 27.5 grams of brain heart extract and peptone extract glucose uh, sodium chloride which is table salt and so on and they just mix all this stuff, stuff together but um, and this would be a complex medium because we have no way of exactly defining what would be in this um, brain and heart extract right here okay so why do we use medium or media um, because of course we need to grow things and some types of media can grow all kinds of different bacteria um, we call that general purpose media so it's just got a whole bunch of stuff in it that a whole bunch of different microbes use example is nutrient agar so remember the agar itself isn't digestible but when we uh, put various nutrients in it then it is nutrient broth is similar that nutrient agar is just liquid brain heart infusion triptych soy agar or uh, excuse me triptychase soy agar which or TSA not to be confused with uh, what is it transportation safety administration I guess enriched media um, enriched with complex complex organic substances such as blood serum hemoglobin so these of course are complex right um, special growth flat factors like specific vitamins specific amino acids um, whatever happens to be required by a specific type of uh, bacterium or fungus or whatever um, would be what would they would put in there okay so these are um, picky microbes which the word that they use for that is fastidious so let's talk about uh, some of these now let's start with blood agar so one of the things that blood agar is used for is fastidious streptococci um, just different types of streptococci um, that have to have this blood agar to be cultured on and so there's this stuff called Thayer Martin medium which I believe I mistyped because I think Martin should be capitalized there uh, so I apologize to whoever that person happens to be anyway also known as chocolate agar and it's not because it's chocolate or got chocolate in it it's because it's brown so it looks like chocolate because what Thayer Martin medium is is blood agar which you can see up here 
this lighter colored one. Um, but what we add to it is this stuff called hemin, which is an iron containing porphyrin. Um, and a nucleic acid called nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, or we just call it NAD. Um, you may have learned about that in um, a biology class at some point because it's used in the whole cellular respiration cycle. Um, it's, this Thayer Martin medium is required by pathogenic Neisseria. I, I may have misspoke or, mis, or not been clear earlier, but the streptococci needs blood agar. This Neisseria uses the Thayer Martin medium. Um, and Neisseria is what causes gonorrhea. Okay, so there's other types of medium called selective and differential media. So selective media contains something that inhibits the growth of certain microbes, but not others. Um, an analogy to that, this is not an example, but an analogy would be like Roundup Ready soybeans. If you're familiar with what that is, they're genetically modified soybeans or soybean plants rather that are not affected by the weed killer Roundup which is an herbicide um, so essentially you can spray Roundup right on the plants and it kills everything but the soybeans so that's similar to how this works okay so it's important for isolating specific microorganisms where you might have a um, sample with many organisms in it, like feces, saliva, skin, water, soil, and so on. All of those things are going to have m hundreds or thousands of different microbes um, in them, and so to be able to isolate them, we may use selective medium media. Uh, so we may use bile salts, for example, to isolate intestinal pathogens. Um, examples are McConkey agar, hectan enteric agar, or HE agar, um, or dyes like methylene blue and crystal violet, which inhibit gram positive bacteria. And we'll talk about why they inhibit them um, later on in this chapter. Okay, so differential media seems like selective media, uh, but it's a little bit different. So so what differential media does is it allows multiple types of organisms to grow but what it does is it allows us to see differences among the microorganisms so some of the examples would be colony size so the little colonies that you see growing on there um, would be bigger or smaller based on this differential media um, and that's among um, the other colony colonies uh, colony color may change so if you see like yellow or red or blue or something like that uh, it would indicate a different type of organism compared to the other organisms or other colonies that you see in there um, changes in the media color again um, based on what happens to be in the medium would determine what is there for the bacteria to digest and based on that it may give byproducts um, of different colors now, you may see a formation of gas bubbles again certain things when they are digested by microorganisms the waste product that's given off is in the form of a gas and so what happens in these um, agar and solids and semi-solids and whatnot as or whatnot is the gas bubbles form so there may be things like you know different organic compounds inside of the medium that when digested they form gas bubbles and so you'll see gas bubbles in the actual medium um, or same thing along the same lines formation of some sort of precipitate again some sort of byproduct um, in most cases of what's being digested by the bacteria so you can have media that is both selective and differential and this an example of that is this McConkey agar and so what McConkey agar does is it selects against gram positive bacteria so it allows gram negative bacteria to grow and it also besides being selective it differentiates between lactose fermenting and lactose 
negative, which are that don't ferment la ferment lactose. So we have lactose in the medium, and the ones that ferment the lactose will create these red colonies that you see there, and the ones that do not will create those yellow colonies. And so that allows us to see there's two different kinds of bacteria there. And the reason why is because there are dyes that they put in here, and when the pH changes, um, because fermentation creates a pH change, um, it creates a, a chemical reaction and uh, colors the colony. So this table in your book shows different types of selective media and it shows what's in them and what makes them selective because they're all based on uh, agar plates, right? Um, and then over on the right hand side it shows what they're used for so feel free to look through that and this is just an illustration kind of giving a, an example so over here on the this left side here shows general purpose medium and media and this just lets uh, everything grow essentially um, over here it shows selective media it says that it only lets one species grow but really probably a better way to say that is it selects against certain types because don't get the idea that selective medium only media only lets one thing grow because that's not always the case. Okay, and over here it's similar. Um, general purpose non differential media um, allows lots of things to grow, but it doesn't necessarily show us a difference among them. Over here you can see that there's three different types of colonies purple, red, and white. And so this differential medium still allows the same things to grow, but it shows us that there is a difference among them. Okay, so let's talk about some miscellaneous media. So there's a type of media medium called reducing medium, and it contains either thioglycolic acid or cysteine. And this uh, cysteine, uh, spelled C-Y-S-T-I-N-E, is not to be confused with the amino acid C-Y-S-T-E-I-N-E. Um, this cysteine is a is a is a dimeric amino acid formed by the oxidation of two cysteines with an E. Um, some people pronounce it cysteine. Um, anyway, so they're covalently linked together in this disulfide bond. Don't stress about that too much. Just, I just wanted to mention that there was a difference here. So what this reducing medium does, and if you know anything about uh, redox reaction, it's oxidation reduction reactions from chemistry, if you remember any of that stuff, um, that's why it's named that, but it absorbs or slows the penetration of oxygen into the medium. So it basically makes it so oxygen is not available to the organisms. And so this is how they culture uh, anaerobic bacteria, uh, bacteria that grow without oxygen. Another type is called carbohydrate fermentation media. And what's in it is sugars, that's what carbohydrates are, right? That can be fermented by the bacteria. And so inside of it, they'll have a pH indicator that shows if fermentation has occurred. Um, they also may have this thing called a durum tube in it. And so you can see it outlined right here, so you can see it better. Um, but what this durum tube is, is it's designed to catch the, the uh, gas bubbles that might form. Because if it wasn't in here, they would just go out the top and go out into the air. So what it does is it makes it so whatever gas bubbles are formed under the tube, they get up here and they get trapped right here. And so again, it's just showing that a specific type of reaction is occurring. Transport media, this is just, as it sounds, used to transport specimens. Um, it makes it so they can be stored in there for a longer period of time. So the three categories of media that we talked about, here's this table in your book that talks about it and sh kind of shows the differences. So feel free to kind of go over and or go over that on your own. Okay, so there's this concept of isolation. So we've talked about it over and over that we want to try to get one specific type of organism to grow. Well, the way we have to do that, remember those five eyes, is through something called isolation. Okay, so the idea is that if we can isolate one individual cell and get it to grow, then every cell that grows from that um, through cell division will form a colony 
um, all of the same type of cell, right? So as we've said before, a colony is a macroscopic, meaning you can see it with the naked eye, um, cluster of cells that you can see in the growth medium that all came from one cell. So when you look at um, a petri dish or whatever, if you've isolated properly, every single one of these colonies sh was at one point only one cell. So the idea is that this petri dish right here, when we did our streak, only had five individual cells on it. Okay, obviously two different kinds um, because we have yellow and white, but still five different cells. So when we do this on solid media, we have to have a firm surface, and that's what we use that agar for. And we do it on a, on a petri dish. That's what this little dish is called. You can put lids on these and seal them with this little piece of wax that you wrap around them. Um, but you need it solid because you need to be able to brush the inoculating tool on the surface of it, or in some cases, drip it with a with a little dropper and things like that. Um, so you use a diluted sample to essentially spread the individual bacterial or whatever cells apart so that they're so far apart that when you streak them or um, drip them on the plate they will naturally be spread apart. So for liquid media it requires the same sort of situation um, but in, in a liquid medium you're actually the liquid is the mixture with the bacteria in it and so you need to have it diluted enough that the bacteria there's not very many bacterium original or uh, uh, individual bacteria in the solution so that they don't grow next to each other they don't end up next to each other um, so this shows how we do isolation on um, solid medium it's called a streak plate and so up here at the top, we have our, uh, where we dumped or poured or whatever, our culture with our cells in it, okay, our, our bacteria. And so what we do is we take this inoculating loop here, it's a little tool, and we scrape it through these bacteria here, and then we streak it. And the idea being that as you streak this, and you do it in this pattern where you streak it across this way, then you go diagonally, and then you go uh, diagonally this way, and then you come across and go uh, horizontally again to end it. And the idea is that as you scrape this along here, you're dropping individual cells or maybe even clumps of cells off as you go. Okay, And so hopefully by the time you get to this last streak here, you have um, lost almost all of the cells, the bacteria, on this inoculating loop. And so what you end up with is you have very dense uh, colonies and then less dense and less dense and less dense until back uh, once you get to this last streak. It's so um, spread out that you only have these individual colonies with only one type of cell in it. Again, the idea being that each colony came from only one cell. Okay, um, by the way, these are all on page 45 in your book. Um, these pictures are. All right, so this is loop dilution, but it's also known as a pour plate. Pour, P-O-U-R, because you pour it into the uh, um, Petri dish. So what we do is we serially dilute these vials full of, uh, or test tubes full of, the, that already have um, liquid agar in them. So we take our loop, we dip it in here into this liquid agar, and then we dump the agar into an empty Petri dish, and, and, and so now we have agar mixed with our bac bacteria, or whatever our culture Wants to, or is. So then we take the loop, same loop, don't do anything to it. We stick it in the next test tube, or uh, yeah, test tube, and dump it in. Now, the idea being that we lost some cells here, right? Um, and so there should be fewer cells here. And then we dump that in. Then we take the same loop, don't do anything to it, dip it in this. And as you see here, we should, as we go, have fewer and fewer cells available to be able to inoculate this medium. 
And so what happens is eventually here we're going to get the right amount of dilution. Okay, so this one's not diluted enough. There's too many colonies here to be able to isolate anything. Um, and if we kept going, eventually we would end up with nothing, right? We would lose all of the bacteria, and we would end up with uh, a plate that had nothing in it. And so you obviously want to be somewhere in the middle, something like this. A spread plate is different. You take this, uh, what they call broth, so it's this inoculating broth. So you have a broth um, with your bacteria in it and you drip it in the in the uh, petri dish with with medium already in it and then you take this hockey stick tool and spread it out over the surface of the agar and then when it grows you hopefully end up with something that looks like that okay so how do we identify these things okay so there's different methods that we use. One of the most obvious and, and original methods is microscopic appearance. Now it's hard to see these and we'll talk about the different ways that we um, dye them and whatnot to be able to see these things. Um, but once we are able to see them with microscopes, um, we look at the morphology, which is a fancy word for the shape, okay? Whether they are um, clusters, whether they're round, spherical, um, shaped like a tube, um, spiral shaped, um, whether they have cilia on them or not, and so on and so forth. Um, cellular metabolism. So the, the different ways that they uh, metabolize, whether it's anaerobically or aerobically or whatever, and that's what we use these isolation and differential media for. Determination of products given off during growth, um, presence of enzymes, that would be things like gas bubbles and whatnot. Um, presence of enzymes, so we have different tests to determine what types of proteins and whatnot are in there. Um, mechanisms for deriving energy, um, such as photosynthesis, um, thermogenesis, or uh, using heat to derive energy, things like that. Um, Genetic and immunologic characteristics. So again, with uh, the, we've talked about with the advancement of, of genetics, um, we couldn't do this before, but now we're able to actually look at the, the DNA, the strands, and, and sequence it and see what the actual code of the DNA is. And so before where we couldn't see so, uh, the difference between certain types of bacteria, now we can. Uh, immunological characteristics uh, would be things like what types of conditions they might cause in a host. Or so again, it's difficult to determine species without advanced methods. And not only is it difficult from a standpoint of, I guess, not being able to at all, it's also more time consuming. And so we've not we, other people have developed these biochemical tests that make identifying specific types of bacteria uh, very, very simple based on what they know about them and they've discovered in the lab. And so um, things like strips and different chemical reactions and um, because they know that whatever byproducts these bacteria give off, they will um, cause certain specific chemical reactions and so that they can use those tests to be able to test for these things much more quickly than have been able to in the past. So we'll talk about these different types of techniques in a later chapter, chapter 15 I think. So you may never have thought about this but at some point we've got to get rid of these things and oftentimes it's just a matter of throwing them in the garbage can. Um, but sometimes it's much more difficult than that because they are um, potentially hazardous, uh, disease-causing organisms that we're dealing with. And so sometimes we have to be able to get rid of them very, very quickly, and they'll do things like incinerate them. There are these things called stock cultures. So what they are is living cultures that they keep in labs, and, and they use them so that they can pull you know, pull them off the shelf and study them. And the biggest culture collection is at the ATCC, 
and what they have are frozen and freeze dried fungal, bacterial, viral, and algae cultures that are available for use at, for different labs. All right, so give an example of specific type of media for each of the general categories below. So for selective media, we could use an enterococcus uh, faecalis broth. We could use tomato juice agar, McConkie agar, Salmonella shigella agar, or Lonestein Jensen medium, or Sabarod's agar. So don't worry about what those are right now. If we need to learn them as we go through this course, we'll learn about them. Uh, different types of differential media would be like blood agar, mannitol salt agar, urea broth, um, sulfur indole motility medium, triple sugar iron agar, or bird seed agar, which is actually from thistle. Uh, types of reducing agar, agar would be like thioglycolate broth or agar, cysteine reducing medium, which you remember was to uh, grow anaerobic um, bacteria, um, or complex agar. Examples of that would be brain heart infusion, tryptocase soy agar. Okay, so we're going to completely switch gears here now and stop talking about media and start talking about the ways that we visualize these microorganisms. Okay, so this is a light microscope. You probably all used these at some point in your life in high school or whatever, even possibly college. Um, so obviously these things are used to see things too small to be seen with the naked eye. Um, a light microscope is limited um, to a, a certain range of sizes. It can only see things so small. Um, and it's limited to things that are thin because the way that it works is by shining light through the object. And so if the uh, object isn't thin enough, um, it can't be seen with a light microscope. They do have these things, uh, a, a lower powered microscope that actually um, shines light on the surface and then reflects it back to the eye, but the magnification on them is not um, not very great. So if, if you need to be uh, looking at something like a tissue sample, they have to slice it very, very thin in order to see it through a light microscope. So this table right here just gives uh, it's just a, a breakdown of sizes um, we use the metric system in science um, so if something is considered to be macroscopic that just m means it can be seen with the naked eye if it's microscopic uh, we're talking about stuff that's uh, with you know from millimeters to micrometers um, micrometers are also called microns and a micrometer is a millionth of a meter. So it's this uh, 1 times 10 to the negative sixth meters in size. Um, or nanometers. So nanometers are nine zeros in front of a one here. Um, so that's like what, a billionth or something like that. Uh, Things that are that small, by the way, are way too small to be seen with a light microscope. Um, viruses, for example, are between 20 and 800 nanometers, and you can't see those with a microscope. Um, the smallest bacteria is about 200 man nanometers. Um, again, not within the limit of a, mi of a light microscope, at least. I mean, not the, you, know, you wouldn't be able to see any kind of detail or anything like that. Um, protozoa and algae can measure three to four millimeters, which is quite large in comparison. Okay, so this table or diagram, I guess, or picture, whatever in your book, 
just shows some different things that you might be able to see and kind of gives you a comparison of the sizes of things that we're talking about. Um, so visible with the naked eye are things like a head lice, um, the reproductive structure of a bread mold, so the little spore containing structures on a, on a bread mold. Um, 100 microns right here, this little upside down U looking thing is uh, what is the symbol used for a mic micro. So uh, these cl uh, colonial algae are somewhere in the 100 micrometer range, red blood cells somewhere, you know, 20, 30 ish, something like that. Um, most bacteria fall between 1 and 10 microns. Um, e. coli, Escherichia coli bacteria, somewhere around 1 micron. Um, when we get down into these really small things, 200 nanometers, we're now in the range of an electron microscope. So a normal light microscope can't see this. So everything back up in this lower section here can be seen. So up to about 1 micron with a light microscope. Um, in this area, we're down in the range of an electron microscope. So the, uh, you can see viruses are all in this area. Um, one nanometer is the size or the diameter of a DNA molecule. Um, and down here in the tenth of a nanometer, which is an angstrom, we're talking about um, actual molecules and atoms in, in size. So very, very small. So let's talk about how a light microscope actually works. So magnification occurs in two phases. So the first part of it is what we call the objective lens, and that's the part that's actually closest to the specimen. So the specimen sits on this little stage here, and these four lenses here are the objective lenses. They're the ones that are closer to the object, right? So this forms the initial image that they call the real image. Um, the other part of it is at what's called the ocular lens, and I'm sure you know ocular means eye. So this is the part, this is the lens that you look, uh, that that's you're looking at with your eye, or that are closest to your eye. Now some microscopes only have one ocular lens, but nowadays most of them have two. Um, so this forms what's called the virtual image. This is the image that actually hits your retina. Um, so it's the larger image that that we can actually see. So by the time it becomes the virtual image it's magnified, right? So this shows the basics of how it works. Okay, so remember we said that the light shines through the specimen. So the specimen is sitting here on this slide. Here's a light bulb, bounces off a mirror, um, is uh, converged to a point and shines up through a condenser lens. So we have a diaphragm and a condenser lens and that just focuses the light and that shoots up through the specimen and this stage can be raised and lowered in order to bring it into the correct focus to match whatever lens. Um, so what that does is that takes the light rays and bends them and then bounces it off of some more mirrors and it gets bent one last time once it hits the ocular lens and it takes uh, the real image and magnifies it so it's big enough to be seen with our naked eye. Okay, so when it ends up hitting our eye, that's what is called the total magnification. And this um, shows how we reach that number of total magnification. Okay, so what we do is we multiply each lens together. And so I said we have, most microscopes have four lenses. So we have the four power, the 10 power, the 40 power, and the 100 power the ocular lens doesn't change okay so they're always 10 power so what we do is we multiply the ocular power by whatever the objective lens is that we're using so the scanning lens the the one that magnifies it the least is 4 power so if we multiply 4 by 10 we get 40 anyway you can figure out how it works but the the highest power is multiplying it by a thousand and what that means is we are increasing the size of it 1000 times so if it, it is something that's one thousandth of a millimeter in size we can magnify it to one millimeter in size okay so there's, con there's this word called resolution and it's also known as the resolving power 
and this is just the ability of um, the optical system to be able to distinguish two different points from one another okay so the lower the resolution or resolving power the less likely you're going to be able to see two separate objects and so this is trying to um, illustrate this down here you can see these are the same size but one of them is much less clear than the other one so this is just a higher resolution and if you know anything about cameras and TVs you already know what this is so the old TVs we used to use were a 480 resolution and now they're 1080 and that's why these high definition TVs are so much more clear even though the picture can be the same size so the human eye can resolve two objects no closer than 0.2 millimeters of, apart and that again is the image that hits your eye um, so the lens that has the highest resolving power is the 100 times lens the one that multiplies it by 100 and then multiplying that by 10 more is a thousand right and that is called the oil immersion lens and the reason why it's called the oil immersion lens is because we have to immerse it in oil in order to get it to work and this picture over here tries to illustrate why um, what the oil does is it bends the light to keep it focused into the lens so normally the light gets scattered off of it and so when we put this little droplet of oil so this is showing it on this side without and on this side with and I, it doesn't this is supposed to be two different lenses um, so this is what it would look like if it were oil and this would, is what it would look like if it weren't anyway you can see that the side with the oil it actually bends the light up into the objective lens okay so um, we can resolve things that are two microns um, in diameter and at least two microns apart anything smaller than that or 0.2 excuse me microns in diameter or 2.2 microns apart um, anything smaller than that we can't uh, even use a light microscope for so contrast um, the contrast is the basically being able to tell the difference between different um, densities of objects okay because remember it's going through the object so it's measured in what's called the refractive index and refraction is the bending of light which is different from reflection which uh, remember reflection is uh, bouncing of light so it's a measurement of the degree of bending that um, un that the light undergoes as it passes from one medium to another now everything has a refractive index um, if you ever seen an object in water you can see that the object looks bent and it varies based on which direction you're looking at it um, that's because of refraction so the higher the difference in refractive indices the greater the contrast is going to be meaning um, if one has a low refractive index and, and another object has a higher refractive index um, you're going to see a higher contrast uh, between the two okay so the iris diaphragm is what controls the amount of light that enters the condenser so that we can use that to increase the contrast because if we get too much light going in it blows it out and it just looks it just it's just a light if we don't put enough in it then it's too dim to see anything and sometimes we'll use special dyes in combination with special lenses um, in order to increase the contrast also in some objects so let's talk about the different types of light of microscopes starting with uh, visible light microscopes okay so the most common one is the bright field this is the one that we've been showing uh, up to this point so as we said light has to be transmitted through the specimen and the way it works is the more dense the object the, the less light that penetrates it and so we what we end up with are these different shades like the picture over there to the right Okay, so the specimen will produce an image that is darker than the surrounding um, field, which is just where it's just penetrating the slide that the thing is sitting on. So we use this for both live unstained material as well as uh, preserved material, which is um, bacteria or fibers or whatever that's on a permanent slide that essentially is a slide with a cover slip glued to the surface of it. Um, 
we also use it for stained materials, which we haven't gotten into staining yet, but we will. Um, a dark field light microscope is just a bright field microscope that, it's a, that is adapted to a dark field by adding this uh, special disc called a stop to the condenser. Um, what it does is it blocks all the light, the peripheral light, and only allows just the light to, that's bouncing off of the uh, sides of the specimen. And so you end up with this picture like the one to the right where you have a bright specimen with a dark background. So it's used in circumstances where typical staining methods wouldn't yield a good picture. Um, so drying or heat that would, it would damage the uh, object that we're trying to look at. So it can outline the organism's shape and permit rapid recognition of swimming cells that might appear in dental or other infections um, where obviously you wouldn't be seeing swimming around if you uh, killed the organism. So it doesn't reveal fine internal details because it's mainly bouncing off the sides of the object. Another one is called phase contrast and we're still in this visible light microscope, right? So what it does is it transforms subtle differences among objects and just makes them less subtle basically. So it adds contrast to similarly dense objects. So it helps us to see things inside the cell or on the outside of the cell like cilia and whatnot, flagella, um, which are the uh, little appendages that stick off of the cells, granules or spores inside the cells and so on. Uh, differential, differential interference or differential interference contrast is kind of like phase contrast um, because it allows us to see unstained live specimens. But what it does is we um, it, it uses prisms to basically separate the different wavelengths of light and what it does is it gives us these vivid um, images where different uh, densities of material are colored in different colors because it shoots two different beams of light so um, it makes these objects also appear more three-dimensional okay so that's it as far as light microscopes go or excuse me, visible light microscopes. So these next ones we're going to talk about are ultraviolet light microscopes, which is invisible light, right? It's right above the violet of our visible light spectrum. Okay, so the first one is called fluorescent. So fluorescent uses ultraviolet light and um, a filter so that it doesn't create damage in the eye, so which, which UV light would do. Um, we dye the specimen so that it reacts with the UV light and it, and it makes it fluoresce. Um, so it, it actually makes the specimen give off light. That's how a fluorescent light works. It, 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 uh, the electricity causes the light to fluoresce and that means it's actually giving off the light itself. So it gives off visible light by hitting it with um, ultraviolet light. So important for identifying um, certain disease causing microbes we'll talk about later on. Confocal is a little different. So we've talked about that when um, an object is too thick, it's difficult to view, especially with a normal light microscope, because we have to shine the light through it, right? Well, the other issue isn't just thickness, and you can even see this with a light microscope. It's that the um, ability for a microscope to focus is on a very, very short distance, and so you can't focus on both sides of a cell necessarily at the same time. Um, this confocal microscope helps overcome this um, because it uses a laser to somehow scan all of the different depths and put all of them onto one um, single plane. And so it, they don't you don't see depth with it, but you do see the different layers. So using this we are able to look at different levels of objects throughout the uh, specimen, okay? Usually used with fluorescently stained specimens but not necessarily. And that brings us to electron microscopes. So electron microscopes are not visible light microscopes or, or any kind of light microscope. It's actually um, using electrons bouncing off of the objects. So 
The first one is a transmission electron microscope. So this is the best method for viewing detailed structures of cells and viruses. So it's produced by transmitting electrons, as I said, through the specimen. But in order to do this, these, the specimens need to be very, very, very thin, 20 to 100 nanometers thick. Um, otherwise, the electrons don't penetrate through them. Um, another method is you can coat the specimen with metal, some sort of metal like gold. Another type is called a scanning electron microscope, and these are the kind that you probably have seen the most pictures of. Um, provides really cool looking images of crazy things like dust mites and whatever. So this is showing um, the cell walls of algae, um, which are made of calcium disks. So the light microscopes that we will use can magnify by a thousand times, and as you can see here, this is magnifying this ten thousand times. 10 times better than a, a light microscope. So it allows a three-dimensional image um, and you can view all kinds of things. So the scanning electron microscope bombards the surface of these objects that have metal coated on them and um, it scans back and forth across it sort of like a printer kind of printing a, a piece of paper. Um, so a shower of electrons is deflected off of the surface and there's a receptor that is able to, to detect that and creates an image that you can see. It's all digital so it's seen on some sort of a, a screen or you, know, you can obviously print it out or something like that. So when you see these things in color, um, that's because somebody went digitally with a computer and colored them because these do not come off as a color image they have come off as black and white because there's no ability to show variation um, uh, um, among color. Okay so let's talk about how we actually make a specimen when we prepare it. So usually prepared by mounting this what we call mounting a slide okay so what it is is a glass slide which is what this thing is here and that thing we'll talk about in a minute as a cover slip. So the slide sits on the stage between the condenser and the objective lens. So you can see this slide right here. So here's the stage, here's the objective lens, and so this little piece of glass right there is the slide. So the type of preparation depends on the condition of the speci specimen, because it could be either living or dead. Um, the goals of the examiner, meaning what it is that you're actually trying to look at, okay, if you're trying to look at structure, identify a specific type of organism, or see movement, that would all determine what type of mount that you use. Um, also the type of microscope that you have, so dark field, bright field, phase contrast, fluorescent, whatever, all would dictate the type of um, uh, slide that you're going to prepare. So if you're doing fresh or living preparations, you use what's called a wet mount or else a hanging drop. Those are not the same thing. Those are two different things. Um, and the reason why we use those is because it, it keeps them alive, essentially, and, and able to, um, if it's, a, it's an object or a specimen that you know, is modal, it allows it to still move around in there. Um, so cells are suspended in water, broth, or a saline solution to maintain the viability of the specimen and allow it room to be able to move around. So even though these mounts don't last very long um, because eventually the, you know, the specimen is going to die, um, we use them so because it gives us an exact um, idea of the size, shape, arrangement, color, and ability and pattern of movement and all of those sorts of things. So a wet mount consists of a drop or two of the culture placed on a slide and then overlaid with a cover slip. So that's what we're looking at right here. You can sort of see it, but that's a square of plastic. Uh, the slide is usually glass and this is the little cover slip is usually a little piece of thin plastic. Um, glass being that thin would, would break pretty easy. Um, a hanging drop is a little bit different. What you do with the hanging drop is you put the drop actually on the cover slip 
and you put Vaseline or some sort of petroleum jelly or adhesive, and it's actually a sealant as well, around it, and then you uh, around this this concavity. So the slide itself, here's the glass here. This actually has a depression right here, and the hanging drop actually hangs off the bottom of this um, piece of plastic into this depression without actually touching it. Well, there's also so, so those were live, right? Um, there's also fixed or stained smears. So these are permanent or at least more permanent that uh, we can use for long-term study. So if you ever in high school or whatever uh, pulled off a slide of a tissue out of a little box, those were fixed and stained mounts. Um, they can last for years and years and years. So one way that they prepare these is something called the smear technique developed by Robert Koch long long time ago um, what it is is a thin film of liquid suspension of cells that you put on the slide you go ahead and you air dry it and then you heat fixate it which is they just put it in an oven and uh, basically turns it very very hard so it, it uh, becomes basically like glued on okay so it's heated gently so that it kills the specimen but doesn't cause destruction of the specimen now oftentimes we have to stain them and the reason why is because you can't necessarily see uh, unstained cells sometimes. So what we do is we put these stains on here which are chemicals um, that they call dyes that will um, stick to and color certain structures and, and it, everything isn't colored the same. Okay, So that gives you some contrast among the different objects. Okay, So there are Dyes called basic or alkaline dyes, and they're called that because they have a positive charge. Um, they're cationic, cations, as you know, is a positively charged ion. Um, they're also acidic dyes, which have a negative charge, or and they also are called anionic dyes. Um, and the reason why we use these is because bacteria have different charged parts to them. Okay, so depending on what we're trying to see, if we want to see negatively charged parts, then we use a cationic dye because negatives uh, um, attract positives, right? And then vice versa, of course. Okay, now there's this thing called negative and positive staining. And be careful about this because we just talked about negative and positive dyes, but this is not the same thing. What we're talking about here is negative um, images versus a positive image. And if you know anything about film, if you're old like me, you remember when we actually used to use film, when you would take a picture you would create a negative and then when you develop it they would reverse it into a positive and that's how you got the picture that you saw. So on a negative everything is backwards. So the lights are dark and the darks are lights. Okay. So a positive stain causes the dye to stick to the specimen and makes the specimen uh, be the thing that has the color and that is as uh, we just talked about like a picture. Um, negative stains don't stick to the specimen and therefore what happens is they uh, stick to essentially they they color the background okay and what that does is wherever the specimen is it shows up lighter so you essentially get a silhouette and that's what all this table is showing in these pictures here so this is positive and this is a negative stain so you can see that in a negative stain the background is dark and the specimens are actually light. So the reason why is negatively charged cells repel the negatively charged dye because positives attracts to po uh, negatives, but negatives will um, repel negatives. And so of course the negatively charged structures don't get dyed. Now in these negative stains you don't heat fix it because it would create distortion or shrinkage of the cells. Um, they also use these to accentuate capsules on cells that have them, not all of them do. Um, examples of these are nigrosin and India ink. These are negative stains and we'll talk about what those are a little bit later. So they do happen to be anionic, um, so they will negatively stain positively charged cells. So we can use these either as um, anionic stains or uh, negative stains. I hope that makes sense. It's a little confusing, but go back to the previous slide if that doesn't make sense. So simple versus differential stain. So a simple stain is uncomplicated. So only one dye is used and it causes all the cells 
in the smear to basically be the same color regardless of what kind of cell they are okay so we use this just for looking at the basic size shape and arrangement of different cells okay and this shows an example of some simple stains here so crystal violet stain for E. coli on the left methylene blue stain of carinobacterium on the right differential stains We'll use diff two differently colored dyes. Okay, so one is called a primary dye, the other one is called the counter stain. And this allows us to distinguish different cell types from each other or different parts of cells. So this is more complex and requires you know different chemical processes to actually get this to come out correctly. So common combinations of differential stains are red and purple stains or red and green stains or pink and blue stains. So one of the types of differential stains is something called a Gram stain developed by this Hans Christian Gram in 1884 and there's four steps to it. The first one is with the primary stain called crystal violet. We then use something that's called the mordant and what that the mordant is is Gram's iodine after that we rinse the specimen with alcohol or acetone and what that does is decolorizes some of it and then we add the counter stain called safranin and so what happens is because of the different structures in the cell it will take these dyes on differently and give uh, it will show some great differences in between the structures Okay, so this is the universal basis for bacterial classification and, ident and identification. So this is one of the original ways, and we'll talk about what stains later on and why we use the Gram stain, um, because phylogenetically it is apparent to us that that was a split in evolution. So it also is a practical aid in diagnosing infection and guiding drug treatment because if we know what kind of infection we have we know what kind of drug will kill it right so as I said we'll talk about that later the gram stain is the most widely employed staining method in microbiology it is a differential stain because it divides bacteria into two classes gram positive and gram negative in the first step of the gram stain procedure, cells from a fresh culture are transferred to a clean slide and allowed to dry. If the cells are on an auger plate, they should first be transferred to a liquid medium for dilution. The cells should form a thin, barely visible film. This can be achieved by smearing cells obtained from the surface of an auger medium or from a liquid culture. Fresh cultures must be used because as cells age, they lose their ability to retain the stain. The cells are then fixed to the slide by passing slightly above the flame of a Bunsen burner. After passing above the flame, the slide should feel warm when touched to the back of the hand, but should not be too hot. The fixed cells are then stained with the basic dye, crystal violet, for 30 to 40 seconds. The slide is then rinsed with water to remove excess stain. At this point, all cells appear purple under the microscope. Next, a solution of Gram's iodine is added and retained on the slide for about one minute. The iodine combines with the crystal violet to form a di-iodine complex, thereby decreasing its solubility within the cell. At this point, the cells still appear purple. The cells are then decolorized by washing with ethanol or acetone. This is the differential step. Gram-positive bacteria retain the crystal violet, whereas gram-negative bacteria do not. The ethanol or acetone should be added dropwise, with the slide tilted at an angle, until the drop coming off the edge of the slide just starts to become colorless. Even gram-positive cells can lose the crystal violet iodine complex during prolonged excessive decoloration. Excess ethanol is then washed off with water. When viewed under the microscope, gram-positive cells appear purple and gram-negative cells are colorless. Finally, the rinsed cells are covered with the counterstain safranin for 20 to 30 seconds. This stains the gram-negative bacteria pink. After rinsing with water, the slide is dried with filter paper. 
When viewed microscopically, the gram-positive bacteria are purple and the gram-negative bacteria are pink. Generally, the gram stain correlates with the cell wall structure among the bacteria. The ethanol is thought to shrink the thick peptidoglycan in gram-positive cells, thus retaining the dye. The thick, dehydrated peptidoglycan layer of gram-positive bacteria appears to be a permeability barrier, preventing the loss of the crystal violet iodine complex. In contrast, the peptidoglycan in gram-negative bacteria is very thin and has large pores. Ethanol may extract lipids and increase the porosity, thus removing the crystal violet iodine complex. Okay, so the long and short of that video is that gram-positive bacteria hold the gram stain and the gram-negative ones lose it and then when we stain it a second time with the saffron and the gram-negative bacteria um, hold on to the saffron and, and that allows them to be colored pink. So another type of differential stain is called an acid fast stain. This difference, difference, differentiates between bacteria and shows them up as either pink or blue. So acid fast bacteria appear pink and non-acid fast bacteria will appear blue. And, the, and this was originally used to detect mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is what causes tuberculosis TB. Okay, so the way it works is acid fast bacterial cell walls um, are particularly impervious. And what happens is it holds tightly to the dye and that's called holding fast and that's where it gets the name acid fast. And the dye is called carbol fusion. So this holds on to it even after it's washed with an acid or an uh, acid alcohol decolorizer. So used uh, for medically important bacteria, fungi, and protozoa as well as this tuberculosis. So there are other things that we use it for. Another type is called an endospore stain, also known as a spore stain. So it's similar to the acid fast stain uh, because the dye is forced by heat into these resistant bodies called spores or endospores that we'll talk about later. Um, these things are really, really, really tough. They can last for thousands of years. Um, if you've heard of the West, what is it, the mummy, curse of the mummy or whatever, uh, that's, that's where this comes from, those sorts of things. Um, but what happens is these, these types of stains are able to distinguish between spores and vegetative cells, um, which appear to look similar until you dye them. So we use these in identifying gram-positive spore-forming members of Bacillus and Clostridium genuses. Okay, so here is some different uh, differential stains. So left side, gram staining, so you can see pur pur purple and pink. Um, acid fast stains, red and blue colors, and spore stains. So the red ones are showing the endospores, and the veget vegetative cell cells are the blue spores. So spores come from uh, bacillus, which is what causes anthrax. Um, uh, special stains. So we use these to emphasize cells, cell parts that are otherwise not seen with these other methods. Okay, so one of the special stains is called capsule staining, and obviously it's used to observe the capsule on cells that have that. So that capsule is just a protective layer that surrounds certain types of bacteria and fungi. So over here on the right, it's showing India ink on this Cryptococcus neoformans, which is, it, it, what it does, it causes fungal meningitis in AIDS. So we use uh, India ink to negatively stain it, or we can use other types of dyes to positively stain it. Another type of stain is called flagellar staining because we are using it to actually be able to see the flagella but because flagella are so small that you can't see them unless you dye them, okay? Um, and most types of dyes don't stick to them and so they've discovered uh, types of dyes that actually do. So there are these, uh, like I said, tiny little fibers that come off of the bacteria. You can see all of these little hairs um, in the human, there's only one cell that has a flagellum, and that's the sperm, and it only has one, but you can see that this one has many of them. 
um, what they use them for is locomotion. It helps them move. So what, what it does is these flagella are enlarged because these dyes that they use actually deposit a coating on the outside of, of it. Um, and then they, we stain the coating. So as I said, without this, flage uh, this flagellar staining, you won't be able to tell the difference. And so this over here is showing uh, Proteus vulgaris with all of its flagella on the outside of it. Okay, so we're going to look through this and decide which ones of these are simple, differential, or special. So capsule staining is a special stain. Acid fast staining is a differential stain, two different colors. Uh, crystal violet is a simple stain. Remember, it just colors everything a, a violet color. Uh, gram staining was also a differential. This is gram positive and gram negative bacteria. And of course, the flagellar stain was special because we are trying to see flagella. And that's the end.